Well, today uh, in our series, Bad Advice is our third installment today. Um, uh, the bad advice of the day, we're going to talk about this and why this uh, is uh, usually bad advice or, or uh, 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 not a correct saying is uh, when people say, God says, do not judge, all right? Can you say, do not judge real loud? Say it real snotty to your neighbors too. Do not judge, right? Do not judge, all right? There you go. Don't judge me, all right? Uh, how many of you have ever seen, uh, there's, a, there's a Netflix show, and I'm not advocating for it, and I'm not at all endorsing it. Uh, you know how this goes, right? It's funny because sometimes my lovely wife will make movie recommendations. I'm like, no, don't, 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 let, don't let people know we watch that. That's terrible. <laughs> like, you forgot about all the stuff we fast forwarded through, right? Uh, but anyway, there's a show uh, on Netflix called um, uh, Your Honor. Has anyone seen that? With Brian Cranston. I got to admit, I'm a little bit of a Cranston fan. And I won't even get into why, uh, because then I'll be judged. Uh, but anyway, it, it's a real interesting um, show. It's only like two, two short seasons. And, and um, there's this kind of this sum, central conflict of the, the story is this. He is, he, uh, Cranston plays this very well-respected judge. And, and he faces this moral crisis when his son is involved in a hit-and-run accident. His son's the one who runs off. And instead of upholding the law as expected, the judge compromises his integrity to kind of protect his son, uh, which you understand better if you've seen the show. And, and what happens is he kind of makes a series of unethical decisions that spiral out of control, tells lies. How many of you know lies have this way of spinning out of control? The, if you watch a show, one of the greatest messages of it is how when you lie, it always grows and grows and grows and eventually will bring you down. Like, you, you, it just it's a good illustration of what happens when you decide to part with the truth. But anyway, um, and what happens is actions kind of reveal this conflict because he's supposed to be this judge, right? And then he's got now all these massive personal failures. And of course, um, his character is very striking because it's a judge and everyone knows that a judge is someone held to a higher standard. Okay, can I get an amen, right? We, we can guess that. Um, but there's this kind of this great hypocrisy that sort of, you know, obviously unfolds in the whole dilemma. And so, now, just like the, uh, the judge in your honor is compromised by his own faults, we often misuse do not judge as a defense uh, for avoiding our own shortcomings. Of course, now if you know, we're going to dig into this, Matthew chapter 7 is the source of that all too often spouted, don't judge me, right? Who are you to judge? Only God can judge me and all of that. It's, it comes from Matthew 7, which we're going to look at in just a moment. But right up front, what I want to tell you and what you're going to learn is that Matthew 7 is not about prohibiting judgment as a whole. Did you know that? Right? It's about confronting our own flaws before attempting to correct others. And that's, that's part of it. I'm going to unpack more of it. But that's really what is the heart there. So uh, in, in the, the little uh, series on Netflix, the judge's failure to live up to his own standards it kind of mirrors our tendency to judge hypocritically when we haven't dealt with our own issues first. Can I get an amen? Right? Uh, this, and this kind of really sets the stage well for what we're going to discuss today. This common advice or saying we throw out there, do not judge. You know, you, God says you aren't supposed to judge anybody. Uh, we should understand that it's incomplete when we hear that. It's misused. Uh, it is, uh, and, and so because of that, it becomes bad, incorrect, or at least incomplete advice leaning us away, especially as believers, to a true call to righteous and healthy, self-reflective kind of judgment. And so that's what we're going to unpack today. Now, I think this is, there's a lot of reasons I wanted to talk about this. And, and those of you who've been here for a while know that three or four years ago, we had a series called Out of Context. Anyone remember that one? Uh, this was actually a passage we took then. And I'd encourage you, uh, there's going to be some similarities, but you might want to go back and listen to that one too as a is kind of to kind of you know pull all of this together, um, but I want to talk about that. I think it's such a good time to talk about. I'll set the stage as to why. Um, there's a lots of reasons why. We'll talk about some of the cultural reasons, but um, as we come into a season that's going to be ramping up, and I mean the political season, aren't we so excited? <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, what I also find is that our criticism and judgment of people ramps up like never before. I, I, I'm going to spend at least two or three uh, sessions throughout the series addressing 
this topic in a way, uh, not really dr dealing directly with political things, but I, I do want to keep us as God's people focused in thinking about how we treat people. Can I get an amen? It matters. It matters a great deal. And just because we move into a political season doesn't give us a license to all of a sudden become everyone's judge and jury and condemn the whole world around us. Can I get another amen, right? I might ask for that a few times a day. Maybe y'all can just like jump in ahead of me. I don't know. Because I, I think that we really need to be in strong agreement over this topic. But I also know a lot of Christians don't get it. A lot of Christians don't understand it. And that even within the church, some people are kind of like, Who, what right do you have to judge me? I feel like you're judging me, right? I feel like you're judging me. Well, we're all, we're all about our feelings today, aren't we? Um, so anyway, we're going to kind of, so have that in mind that there's a practical application around all of this for us today, and it really comes down to how we treat people. And, 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 and so we're going to, I want to kind of break this down. We're going to spend a little time with it today. Um, but again, there's several ways in which this bad advice is stated. So let's discuss them and why do not judge as a whole is really kind of bad advice as is. You know, so one of the translations when people say do not judge, and, and that that's sort of this axiom of truth, we, we believe. Um, one of the things that people mean that, or, or suggest that it means is that, well, or what they're kind of saying is, well, we, you should never speak up. You don't ever have a right to say something. That's one of the ways we kind of get that uh, deduced. But here's why that, in that view, is bad advice. Because silence isn't kindness, it's complicity. Oh, there we go. A couple of you, uh, right? Silence isn't kindness, it's complicity. That's what it is. Now, many people use the do not judge to avoid uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> but, I mean, none of us like an uncomfortable conversation, especially if it kind of centered around us and our behavior or, or ideas, but avoiding judgment altogether kind of leads to this lack of accountability and moral guidance within the community, and we are going to put some clear definition around what we mean by community in this context of judgment. We're going to talk about that, so let's, let's start here. Let's go to the passage here. Get your Bibles ready to go to, to Matthew chapter 7, uh, or um, this is where we're going to dig into this in just a moment, but just to give you a little background as you're turning to Matthew chapter 7 is that the context of this, it comes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew. Uh, Jesus has been talking about the religious leaders and how they practice their righteousness. And he calls them out for hypocrisy because they love to call attention to themselves when they pray out loud. They like to pray these big fancy prayers. They love to let people see how much they put in the offering plate. See, I'm so generous and taking care of people. Or, hey, I'm fasting, I'm super spiritual. And they really love to be seen doing all of these things. So it's hypocritical to behave that way. And, and in their hearts, there's something else going on. So, so the leader, under the leadership of these teachers, what's happening is that the kind of the, 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 the setting or the tone of the worship of the people had become all about one's worthiness to others instead of our, you know, one's humility before a powerful God and serving him. So what happens is now righteous acts are done so that they're seen by people and not really a concern for what God sees. How many of you know people see what's on the outside and God sees what's on the inside, right? So, so what happens is, is, so now people are doing it to get approval from others. Leaders love it because now they get to be the judge and jury and they, they love to express condemnation against those they didn't see as sufficiently obedient to their rules. It's not a good example at all of how community and worship should work. So, so the people are following the example, and this is and, and the result of all of this environment is you've got this restrictive, condemning, fake religious experience, and really fear and pride are the ultimate you know parties in control, and there's no humility and graciousness, um, which are the things that should prevail. So that's the backdrop. Now let's go to verse one. Matthew 7 says this, do not judge others and you will not be judged. So you can see already we only get like part of the verse. And we definitely ignore the following verses. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? Uh, how can you think of saying to your friend, 
Let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye. Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. All right. So again, he, he, he's speaking about hypocrisy. He's speaking about motives. He's talking about self-reflection here. And I want to be clear about this. Jesus condemns hypocritical judgment, not all judgment. In fact, we are called to help each other see clearly, not stay silent. Right? So this is interesting because this is not at all, how many of you know this is not what your friends think it says? Right? This is not what people think this says. This is not what the culture wants this to say. It's not at all what it says. Jesus isn't condemning loving, uh, or, or rather the loving and just work of bringing judgment to things. What Jesus is, is uh, speaking to and condemning himself is an attitude and disposition, disposition to look unfavorably on the character and action of others, thinking ourselves above them, and then pronouncing rash, unjust, and unloving judgments upon them. Jesus warns us, verse 2 again, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. How many of you would love God to judge you with grace? Well, uh, then maybe we should exercise some grace in our judgments, right? So there's a, there is a standard. Now, in keeping with Jesus' teaching, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul encouraged the believers in Galatia to have this in mind when it comes to our role in happy, helping rescue and restore a brother or sister in trouble. Galatians 6.1 says this, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, right? How would you know that, by the way? You would need some discernment and you would need to make some judgments. You who are godly should gently and humbly help that person, help that person, rescue that person, um, help restore that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So Paul is saying, look, we, we want to help restore, in a sense, correct others gently and humbly, but we do intervene or co connect, correct them. We want to engage them. We're working to rescue them, to help them. Uh, that, a lot of times, may require being very blunt and honest about what you see at work in their lives. And uh, because, what well, again, we should understand is that true love doesn't ignore sin. Doesn't ignore it. Um, what kind of love would it be if, if we uh, had somebody that didn't realize the way they were living was on, putting them on a trajectory to hell and they never heard the gospel truth? How loving is that? Whose responsibility is it to help them see? So there's some thoughts about that. Now, again... I'll, we're going to come back to this idea of those inside the community and those outside the community and those we're in relationship with and those we have no relationship with. This, that's really important. We're going to break that down in a moment. But restoring someone from wandering is an act of love. Come on, somebody. This requires discernment and judgment. We've got to have it or we won't know they're wandering. So it is involved here. Now, some people would say, well, only God can judge me, but but we are called to judge. We're just called to do it wisely. And this becomes a bad or advice or wrong advice if we say that because we are called to judge. Uh, but as we've already started to talk about, and I'm going to remind you this once again as we go, but we need to start with the mirror, right? It has to start with the speck, or rather, sorry, the plank. I love that Jesus says that the friend has a speck and we've got the plank. You know, we've got the log, right? They got a little sawdust. We got a whole log in our eye. Because speaking to the hypocrisy, we have to start in the mirror. Now, I hate to break it to you, though, because um, uh, the Bible, for those of you that still maybe aren't so sure about this, but the, Bible's, the Bible does call believers to exercise righteous judgment in the church, but it has to start with self-examination. And we, as Christians inside the church, uh, now, you don't have to raise your hand. I hope, I hope everyone here is a believer or on their way to, you know, trying to position ourselves in the family of God, here's what you need to know if you're a Christian. You are not above anyone's judgment. You, even from outsiders, are subject to their judgment. Not their condemnation. No one's condemnation, just to be clear. But we as believers are subject to everyone's judgment, inside the church and outside the church. 
for, uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna show you an illustration of this in just a moment. And, uh, and, and, and it, not only if we have a mindset that no one can judge me and we're a believer, it's incorrect, but it also creates a barrier to personal growth and accountability. How many of you know being a Christian is about accountability and personal growth? In part, uh, among many things, it is. And if we reject all judgments that are, that are offered to us, we're going to be closed off to any real development and growth in our lives. And, and, and I think this is important because when we get to the end, I, I think there are some Christians in the room, you are carrying offense still today because you had another brother or sister in Christ speak honestly and bluntly about something in your life. Maybe they didn't do it in the kind of love they should have. Maybe it came with a side helping a condemnation you didn't need and that hurts. But if they spoke truth to you and you're walking around wounded that they judged you, you might need to repent. Because they may not have gone about it the right way, but their judgment may have been correct. And, and the wounds you're carrying is actually still a call to repentance. And so it's something to think about. We'll get more into that. So let's talk about this inside-outside thing. And, and uh, I'm going to risk making an example today. Um, but uh, I want to talk about this. So Christians are to call Christians to account. So I, I, just yesterday, as I was kind of wrapping up preparation, I came across something in one of my feeds uh, through, and, I, and, I, and I, I saw, I thought, well, this is interesting. I, I, I thought, I'm going to show this because it gives something to talk about on this topic. I don't know if you caught this. So apparently last week there was a football game, and, and there was a player by the name of Derek Carr. Anyone know who Derek Carr is? Good. We have, oh, we have a couple of those people. All right. So some of you with fantasy football teams know who he is, right? So he... he he did something in the end zone that was uh, been highly celebrated by the NFL, but he received some chastisement because he is a professing Christian. In fact, uh, none other than a, 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 a personality pastor by the name of Ed Young out of Texas decided to call him out on it on social media. Now, I'll warn you, uh, now the, the picture gets blurred, but you'll have a full, clear understanding of what it is that, that uh, this Derek Carr did. So uh, at the risk of getting letters later, uh, just show, show the video. We'll talk about it. It's 50, did you 50. see Derek Carr's end zone dance when the Cowboys played the Saints? The guy grabbed his crotch in front of millions and millions of Americans. What a horrible example, Derek. What a terrible thing to do. You call yourself a Christian and you're doing that? It's a bad example for the cause of Christ, a bad example for your four kids, a bad example to you and your wife. I mean, if I was your coach, I would bench you like that. I don't care if you're making 37 million or what. And if your coach was a man, he would do it. And I'm gonna be a man and say, hey, Derek, step up and apologize. What you did was wrong. And here the NFL is posting it like it's some great video and you're even posting it. Derek, wake up and smell the coffee, my man. Apologize. What you did was wrong. Ooh. Whew. How are you glad, how are you glad that it wasn't you and it showed up in your feed, right? Now, uh, okay, so, so this is it's a great piece of dialogue about. Did, now, uh, you, can, uh, you don't have to answer out loud. We'll, we'll, we'll work through this. Did, did Pastor Ed Young make the right judgment? Did he have discernment about all of that, Right. Now, uh, uh, and then there's a question then about how he went about this and whether he should. So let me, so let me, just, let me just give you my assessment of, of, of this right here for what it's worth, okay? First of all, um, it's one believer uh, calling out another believer. All believers are subject to all of the body of Christ. They are all accountable to our actions to one another, both in the capital C, but it's more so especially in the lowercase c. Uh, we all owe the greatest, greatest and highest level of accountability to one another in this room. Can I get an amen? Now, believers at large, especially public figures, um, need, need to be brought account, and, and often it doesn't happen within the context of their, their local churches for some reason. So sometimes they draw national or, or broader scrutiny, and that can happen. Now, uh, my thoughts about this are this, though. Um, I, I do not agree that Pastor Ed should have done it the way he did it, because Matthew 18 tells us to first do what? Go to someone in private. So you have one famous person, one celebrity pastor, calling out a celebrity you know, NFL player on the devil's playground called social media, and he makes this public thing. And now here's, now here's the other problems I've got with it. So he didn't do it privately. I think, I think that probably he actually knows Derek. 
because Derek goes around and he's, he, he's always being interviewed by pastors and churches. He's at conferences. He, he's a very prolific Christian speaker and shares his testimony all the time. So there is a right judgment about his actions. They were actually unbecoming of a Christian. They, they weren't appropriate for a man of God. And he is on public display. There's a lot of judgment and responsibility in that. So that wasn't a good example. Like, I totally agree with that. Um, now, I don't know where his own church and pastor are at in that conversation. That's not my business in, in many ways. And I don't know that Pastor Ed should have made it his business. Uh, because, again, I think private is the first command, Matthew 18. Uh, the other thing is that <clears throat> I don't know whether Ed Young has any relationship to this guy. Uh, as far as I know, he doesn't know him personally at all which would really just make that out of place. Like, there's no relationship. He has no pastoral authority really over him. He's not part of his congregation. So there's aspects of it that I, I, like, I don't agree with. Like, I don't think it's a good example of how we elevate things. But I think what we should understand is uh, Derek can't say and shouldn't say, you don't have a right to judge me. Because we as all believers stand together and say, we have to hold each other accountable. The way it was done, though, was a poor, and, and then, and to be truth be known, I, I think Pastor Ed has a lot of things to repent for, too, myself. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but I think it's an interesting example, because it, you, what, if you look at the video, there's a huge raging debate on, should he have said it? Right? And you wouldn't believe, there are probably a thousand, hundred times it says, do not judge, do not judge. Like, everyone quoting, think, thinking they're quoting scripture back at Ed, and, and they're wrong. They're all wrong about their advice on the matter. But um, that's not the way, Christians should not publicly in front of the whole world air out their laundry. That's really embarrassing, that's just as embarrassing to Christ as the crotch grab, let's just be honest, right? So let's learn from that, okay? A learning moment, right? At, the, at others' expense, that's the best. Uh, so uh, I thought that was interesting to see that. But there is a point here that I want to make, and that is that we are to hold each other accountable for our words and deeds within the church. Now, if Ed had come out and said this about some other NFL player who's not a believer at all, I would say you're completely out of line. Like, there's no, there's no benefit in doing that at all. That, there's no benefit in that doing it what, whatsoever. Um, but Paul, I, I want to point out something in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, chapter 12 and 13, um, that the Apostle Paul kind of notes something of a limited scope of the judgment we have. Here's what I want to focus on, verse 12. It isn't my responsibility to judge who? Outsiders. Now, uh, I'll pause there one second. We'll uh, leave the verse up there. Those outsiders, I, I think we're really referring to those, are outs outside of the family of God, outside of our church, outside of the faith. But I would say there is an element of it that might apply to people outside of our congregation, even if they're in other bodies. Our job is not to police every other church in the world. That's not our responsibility. We, we, uh, uh, the greatest accountability is right here. But he says, so it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are what? Saying the wrong things? Uh, having different opinions than you? Wearing clothes you don't approve of? Not parenting their kids the way you like? Right? So... There's a lot to unpack and like, what, what are the right things to judge about? And what is clear here is that the issue of sinning is the scope of our judgment. It's the scope of our judgment. And, God, and he goes on, verse 13, God will judge those on the what? Louder, I can't hear you. But as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. Now, let me give you a little bit of context here so you just know how crazy this was. Uh, now, Paul is speaking here specifically of transgressions far exceeding anything our NFL player did there, or that we know of. Paul is addressing sexual immorality, Im immorality in the Corinthian church. A man had begun having a sexual relationship with his stepmother. And here's the thing, everyone knew it. And here's another thing, apparently it was cool. In fact, nobody was saying anything about it, doing anything about it. And I'm not quite sure how or in what way, but Paul even says in the scripture that they were boasting about it. Maybe like, oh, they are, aren't they adorable? Love is love. And you know, who knows what kind of sayings they were putting out there, right? Perhaps people were defending the couple. You know, maybe they thought it was a justified relationship or whatever. But whatever, Paul says they were boasting about it. 
Now, I'm not going to put it on the screen, but let me go back to verse 2 and read just a couple of verses here so that you can kind of get a better flavor. It says this. He says, you are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning and sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Even though I'm not with you in person, I am with you in spirit. And though, and as though I were, I have already passed judgment on this man. So Paul is judging sin. Now here he has, now he doesn't go to this church, but he knows these people. He's got relationship and he is an apostolic authority over them. That's not in the verse. Verse, uh, verse four goes on. You must call a meeting of the church. I will be present with you in spirit and so will the power of our Lord Jesus. Then you must throw this man out Hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. It's interesting. Even here, judgment is rendered. Discernment must be used. Judgment is rendered. And because he's unrepentant, that's the reason why, he must be put out of the church in order that he would finally wake up and realize one day after Satan's had his way with him of just what he has lost and what he's missing and the goal of putting him out of the church is that he might come back in repentance and humility and, and ask for forgiveness and be made right before the whole community. Right? That's the goal. That's the point of it. Which, by the way, is the point of all excommunication. The point of all excommunication is ultimately restoration. Is restoration. That is always the point. Should be the point. Um, that, that's what we should hope for, what we should pray for. But, but make no mistake, Christians are responsible for judging those inside the church uh, main, because we are responsible for maintaining integrity and accountability. And can I just say even more so for the leaders of the church, amen, 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 amen. Right? For me, for your elders, for anyone who's a leader, anyone on this platform should be held to great levels of accountability and we are subject to the judgment of everyone. Not condemnation, praise God, judgment where it's needed. So, when a fellow Christian quotes Matthew 7, 1, out of context, they're only revealing their ignorance of the many examples set by Jesus and his apostles in doing this. They never get around to looking at those examples where, they, where we are told to make judgments, use wise discernment, like when Jesus pleads with the religiously arrogant back in John chapter 7, verse 24, and he says this, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. In other words, there is a right way to judge and a wrong way to judge. Judge in the right way. That is your job, after all, as religious leaders. But a lot of Christians these days kind of look at things around them, and, and even to those closest to them, they withhold wise discernment on matters. Why? Well, they don't want to stir the pot. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to say the wrong thing. They don't want to cause, say it with me, offense, drama. Yeah, right, all of that. Right? Well, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I won't do that. Now, and, and, and we might say, well, who am I to judge? But Jesus' message, to be clear, wasn't, was, was not telling us to abdicate from all of the assessments we need to make regarding what's good, bad, helpful, hurtful, false, true, beautiful, or evil. If his spirit is in us, we will know, can, and should assess all of this contrast. I've shared this before a long time ago, but A.W. Tozer, who lived from 1897 to 1963, said this. The greatest deficiency in the church today is a lack of spiritual discernment. How can there be so much Bible knowledge and so little insight, so little moral penetration? It's one of the mysteries of the Christian world today. That's a pretty strong statement, and, and, and I think it's still true today, perhaps more than ever. Now, there's several problems with someone citing Matthew 7 as evidence that Christians have got no business pointing out someone else's sin or, 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 or be in the business of discerning and making judgments, right? And it, because later when you go in the chapter, you're going to see Jesus more fully illustrate that, look, uh, you should be doing this, and it's really obvious because you can know a tree by its fruit. And so let's look at verse 15 to 20. He says this. Now, in this instance, the problem or topic is that of false teachers, like many of our megachurch pastors today. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. You, can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. A bad tree can't produce good fruit. 
So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Does that sound like judgment, by the way? Now, that's God's judgment, to be clear. We don't throw anyone to a fire. Thank goodness. We never want to be burnt to a crisp. Verse 20 says, yes, you, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. In other words, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are all called to be, this is how we kind of uh, phrase this over many, many centuries, we are called to be fruit inspectors, discerning good and evil in ourselves and in others. We must grow in it. But now, uh, it doesn't stop there. We kind of learn that actually our role, you know, beyond, you know, just our immediate lives and problems, it's, it's really interesting. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 2. This will really offend people out there. Verse 2 and 3 says this. Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? That's interesting. And since you are going to judge the world, can't you decide even these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that we will judge angels? So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. Now, the context here is Christians in a church suing one another for stupid reasons. And what they do is these Christians are suing one another, and then they go to a secular judge who does not have the mind of Christ or the values of of Christian principles, and they go to them to get their problems worked out rather than using the wisdom and judgment we should have in the church. This is really good advice, practical advice. How many of you know we are like in a litigious society today? All right. If for some reason anyone in this church decides they're going to go to law, sue someone else in this church, what Paul is saying is don't you dare take that to a secular court. Don't you dare show up with your lawyer at a secular court to settle an issue between believers. You have among you people wise and discerning with the Spirit of God who can settle the matter for you. Can I get an Amen. It does be cheaper, by the way, too. If you're an attorney, I'm sorry. I don't mean to take away your work. But here's, here's the thing. I'm, but, but that's really interesting. And, and in this case, you know, uh, Paul's like, he's like, you're going to judge the world someday. So maybe we should get really good about discerning and judging matters among us because, after all, someday we're going to be under and in the authority and kingdom of Christ as, and, and the sons and daughters of God, and we're going to share in his authority and in the administration of all things, angels will be beneath us, and all of the, the, all the new earth will be beneath us, and we will exercise our judgment. So uh, we better put it to practice. So now what we do need to understand is God is the ultimate judge of human and angels. But again, we have a, a role to play, so let's practice well. And this also becomes bad advice if we say, you know, judge not, you know, lest you be judged because we think it lets us off the hook from, again, self-reflection, right? And so when we feel judged by another believer even, we kind of look back at them and say, don't judge me, who are you to judge me? Or I feel judged by you. And we make those kind of remarks. And so um, and what we need to understand is that when we make those remarks, what we're doing, listen to me closely, when we push back, what we're doing is we're deflecting personal responsibility. We're deflecting and putting off any willingness to grow. And so we want to be receptive even to the harshest of criticisms. Now, um, again, the command is not to stop judging altogether, but to ensure we judge ourselves first, removing the hypocrisy. So once again, in case we don't have it yet, judgment begins at home with our, with your own heart. That's where it starts. Now, Romans 14, 10 through 13 reminds us to avoid condemning others, right? This is a problem. This is why, this is why the idea of judging, judgment has become so unpleasant in everyone's palate is because a lot of times we're not really offering helpful judgment or life-saving judgment. We're offering condemnation. And we need to remember that the world doesn't always know the difference between the two. So we have to be very cautious. The best way to do that is to walk with humility. So look at Romans 14. It says this. So, and we're almost done. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will stand all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to who? Jesus, right? 
and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you'll not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Really, really good wisdom. We will give a personal account to God. In fact, Scripture tells us we will give an account for every idle word we've ever spoke in all of our lives. God, God knows us. Now, here's a beautiful reality. For those of you that have had wrongful condemnation heaped upon you, that judgment doesn't matter because only God's judgment matters. And one day, while everyone else maybe just does not see what your motives were, and assuming they're right, and they misread them as wrong in every way, you will stand before your creator one day and their judgment of you won't even be a factor in the consideration. Your God, your King, your Creator, your Father in Heaven alone will render judgment upon each of us for what we have done, right? Our words and actions and deeds for our hearts. That is where our judgment comes from. We, and, and, and ultimately, any, any condemnation will, will be of the Father who will condemn sin as a whole and its work in people's lives. So we need to remember that. In fact, uh, Jesus, what Jesus said again in Matthew 7 has got nothing to do with condemnation. James makes sure we do not confuse our role and God's role. He says this, James 4, 11 through 12, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you, God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor, right? And again, the, the angle here is that of in condemnation, uh, judging them to doom, right? And I say, well said, James. So we avoid evil judgment by recognizing our place, that God is the ultimate judge. We are not above his law, and our judgment does not outrank his. I will tell you right now, I've made a lot of judgments about others, and as I've reflected about it over time, I've always thought to myself, I'm so grateful that God is God and not me. Because I'm not very gracious sometimes. Uh, but God is gracious. And I might judge this, and I might be right, but, but thankfully for them, God is their judge. God is the one who's going to work this out. God's the one who's going to deal with this issue. God's the one who's going to take it up with them. And, and I don't mean to condemn them and beat them and abuse them, but to love them through whatever it is their, 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 their issue is, right? His grace is wonderful. Uh, we want to judge the way he judges um, in terms of uh, that we would walk in humility and grace. And let's not forget, how many of you, John three sixteen, Jesus, you know, gives us this wonderful promise, right, about God living in the world. He's coming to the world to, sa to save it. But look at John three seventeen. This is important. This is the mission of Jesus. God sent his son into the world, not to, what does it say? Judge the world, but to do what? Interesting. Jesus didn't actually come into the world to do what? Judge it. He came to save it. It's interesting. So, we should remember Matthew 7, and verse 2. You will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. So we want to remember this side of Jesus' mission. His mission was not to come and judge people. His mission was to love people. In the church, though, we've been given the sacred responsibility as a family, part of God's kingdom, to bring judgment and discernment to one another in all ways. And we violate all of these standards of Jesus when we think the worst of other people, when we only speak to others about their faults and failures. Like, you got a brother or sister of Christ coming to you, and the only time they ever come to you is to complain about something you're doing? Something's not very healthy in them. Like they, they never come to you with praise. They only come to you with, with constructive feedback. That, that's concerning, right? When we judge one's entire life only by its worst moments, how many of you are so grateful that that you have not been judged by all of your life's worst moments, right? 
you know, that's, that's not a good way for us to be. When we try to judge the hidden motives in people's hearts, how many of you are uh, omniscient and can see into the hearts of everyone around you? Well, stop acting like it. Stop assuming the motives of all the people around you. When someone comes and says a hard thing to you, stop assuming they're out to get you. Maybe assume that they're actually trying to help you in some way and that they actually care and love you enough to come and say something to you. Receive that. Don't assume what their motives are. Uh, that's important, so we want to be cautious of that. We, we stray from the standard of Jesus when we do that, right? When we judge others without considering ourselves and their circumstances, when we judge others without being fully mindful that we ourselves are being judged, right? These are all things that we should keep in mind. Now, I'm going to close on this. We've heard the bad advice. You want to hear the good advice? I think this is good advice right here. Now, Matthew 7, verses 1 through 5, are what's always preached on. How many of you noticed, though, if you looked in your Bible, there's actually another verse hanging on to that section. Anyone notice that? It's called verse 6. We skip over this one, but it's really important invite, advice on this topic because here's what it says. It's almost always excluded when this is preached on. It says this, Matthew 7, 6. This is in the same breath. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls and then turn and attack. And you kind of go like, okay, well, there's the part of the wisdom we were lacking. There are several viewpoints of what Jesus could mean here, but in context, I think we could think of godly correction as a pearl, which stings for a moment. But that pearl shouldn't be cast between swine, cast before swine and pigs. In other words, those who are not determined at all, who are determined not to receive it. Why? Because nothing good ever comes out of it. It's pointless. It's worthless. It doesn't help. You chewing out your, you know, unbelieving neighbors for what they're doing is not helping. It's not helping winning the, the Christ. It's not useful. You, you getting on social media and blasting people for the way they live is not helping the cause of Christ. You are throwing your pearls out, and it's not welcome. They don't want it. They're going to just trample it, stomp on it, and guess what? All that's going to happen is they're going to be ticked off at you, ticked off at Jesus, and ticked off at the church. It's not useful. Are there, there's a bigger questions to work through, like, well, are there ways in which Christians should seek to influence things in our culture, in our politics? We're, sure, absolutely, that's a different conversation. But I'm talking about the things we pull off in our everyday life here and, and think we can get away with. So here's the thing. Uh, I'll close on this thought because this is important and related. If there are people in our lives who want to argue that there could be no judgment at all regarding their sinful choices, you need to be stand firm in what you're called to do and not let them dictate to you what love is or what love does. A Christian is called to show unconditional love, but the Christian is not called to show unconditional approval. And that is a whole other sermon we can open up a little bit later. With that, I just want to invite us to bow our heads here in our hearts. And uh, I, I first of all, just want to speak to those in the room who um, maybe have a thought about their eternal life and their relationship to God as a whole. Um, it might be that you're here today that a lot of people have judged you. They've cast judgment on you. But I want to remind you once again whose opinion truly matters. It is the opinion of God the Father. It's Christ. 2 Timothy 4.1 says this, One day Christ will judge the living and the dead. And one day everyone in this room is going to stand before God. And it won't matter what your neighbors thought of you at all. It won't matter what other Christians in the church thought of you. What will matter is how you stand before God and your relationship with Him today. And I would encourage you, if there is sin in your life, if there's hardness in your heart, if there's unforgiveness in your bones, if there's some other issue going on in your life, I want to encourage you to repent and make it right with God because he will judge you. He will be your judge. And, and I love that when we bring to this judge in humility our faults and failings and sins and we, we lay them before his feet and we repent of those, and we ask for his help, he is the good judge who doesn't throw us away. 
He's the judge who gives us another chance and washes us clean. He clears our record and he says, you know what? I paid for that debt a long time ago. That sin is taken care of. It's covered under my blood. Go and sin no more. That is what he told the woman who was caught red-handed in adultery. Go and sin no more. Where are your accusers? They're not here to judge you and neither do I condemn you, right? That's what Jesus said. And for those that maybe have a hard time receiving admonishment, feedback from those who love your soul, it is important that all of us practice humility in the giving and receiving of judgment because we all need to grow. It may feel like criticism in the moment. It may not be delivered in the best way possible, but I want to challenge all of us to get really good at extracting out what's true and what's right and what's helpful and applying that to our lives and you can throw away the rest. So Father, today I pray for your people. I pray for those that maybe today are at odds with you that they'd be reconciled to you. I pray that today you would liberate anyone in the room from the weight of condemnation in the powerful name of Jesus. Let no one walk out these doors today with the weight of condemnation upon them. May we only give discernment and judgment in love and in grace and in with a heart to help. But Lord, thank you for giving us good advice. Thank you for giving us a perfect teaching. And I pray that we would get it right every time. In Jesus' name, we just thank you and pray and we give you all praise today. Amen, amen, and amen.